Hello, good morning, Coalition. It hello, hello. Great to see you this morning. It's a bright, sunny morning, at least where I am. And um, it's, it's great to have everybody with us. We've got a wonderful interview this morning with Dr. John Moskop, who has been with us in the Coalition for pretty much the whole time, I think. And um, it's wonderful to have him. But first of all, let's... Um, let Allison give us a quick update, and while you're thinking of it, please sign in and give us your name and, and organization. Hello, everyone. Good morning and happy Friday. I hope you all had a nice week. Um, just a couple of updates I would like to highlight. The first one is a caregiving um, family education and support class hosted by Durham Tech. That registration deadline is Sunday. Um, this year they are hosting that virtually, um, so feel free to check your member email to register for this class. Another reminder that the Coalition on Aging is having their annual meeting in September. Um, that link to register is also in your member email. They are doing a hybrid model this year, so you may attend virtually or in person. Another annual conference, the Carolina Center has their annual conference, so feel free to visit their website to register and learn more information there. Um, there are a lot of great speakers there um, discussing the topic of serious illness, so go ahead and check that out on their website. And then lastly, um, the advanced care planning um, issue brief, um, visit our website, you log in and then under the resources tab, the third one down is the issue brief. You can view the issue brief right here on the screen and then fill out this brief form if you would like to sign on on behalf of your organization. Um, you can also download a PDF copy if you need to share it within your networks in order to get permission to do so. And then you can join the following organizations below to sign on. So if you have any questions related to the issue brief, upcoming events, or resources that were found in the member email that went out yesterday, feel free to send me a note in the chat or send me an email after Friday Facts. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Allison. So, John, Dr. Moskow. Great to have you with us. Great to be here, thank you. So I'm gonna read just a, a, a snippet of your bio here. Uh, John C. Moskop, PhD, is Professor of Internal Medicine and Wallace and Mona Wu Chair of Biomedical Ethics at Wake Forest School of Medicine. He chairs the Clinical Ethics Committee at Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center and is a core faculty member of the Wake Forest Biomedical Graduate Program uh, from 2000, excuse me, from 1979 through 2009, 29 and a half years, he told me. Uh, he was a faculty member in the Department of Medical Humanities of the Brody School of Medicine at Eastern Carolina University. And I could go on, but rather than spend a whole lot of time uh, re reading through that, and, and I'm sure there is a lot more because you've published hundreds of, uh, of articles and you've written a, a great book, uh, Health and, and uh, let's see, Ethics and Healthcare, an introduction, which was published uh, in 2016 by Cambridge University Press. Um, but let's, let's talk a little bit about who uh, John Moskop is uh, and, and a little bit about your background, if you don't mind. So where'd you grow up and tell us a little bit about what you did when you were young. Sure. Uh Happy to do that. Uh, I was born and raised in Chicago, Illinois. Um, I was the eldest of five uh, children. Um, uh, so uh, that's where I, I spent my early years. Um, uh, uh, I did my undergraduate <laughs> studies at the University of Notre Dame and then did the uh, doctoral program in philosophy at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, and uh, uh, what else shall I say? Uh, uh, <laughs> well, well, so you grew up in Chicago, John, you, yeah. in, in far, you, you told me it was far south Chicago, a very Outside, interesting yes. mm -hmm. right. uh, community. Your grandparents were Dutch on one side and German mm -hmm. on the other. So when did they immigrate to the United States? 
Um, my maternal grandmother immigrated from Holland when she was about six years old. That would have been about 1905. Um, oh. my, my grandfather uh, was born in uh, in Chicago in the United States, but his parents had had uh, immigrated from the Netherlands. So, um, so okay. it was a strong Dutch heritage on my mother's side of the family. Um, so we had uh, a uh, Dutch community. I went to a Dutch church and to a Catholic school that was run by that church that was uh, uh, very much a, a, a sort of a Dutch uh, uh, organization. Uh, lots of folks from Holland there. Uh, I, I, I had a friend who was Dutch, uh, and she used to say, if you're not Dutch, you're not much. <laughs> I don't I like know it. if you've ever heard that or not. No, I hadn't heard that. <laughs> <laughs> that was an interesting statement yeah. that she used to say. But, um, so uh, what, what did you want to do when you were growing up? What, you, know, I'm, you, you told me you weren't always thinking about ethics or bioethics, but what, 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 what was driving who you were? Um, you know, I enjoyed uh, academics uh, and I was a good student, so I really didn't have a clear career path in mind in high school. Um, and it, not in the most of my college days either. Um, I ended up uh, majoring in uh, the program of liberal studies at Notre Dame, which is a kind of a great books program on the sort of St. John's University of Chicago model modified. But I also did a foreign study program for a year as an undergraduate uh, in Innsbruck, Austria. So I had a great experience uh, and introduction to, uh, to living in Europe for a year. Um, so um, when it came time uh, for me to think about what to do after college, I decided I would go on to uh, uh, apply to philosophy graduate programs and did and uh, ended up choosing uh, the, the doctoral program at the University of Texas at Austin, partly because they offered me a, uh, uh, a, a teaching uh, uh, stipend as a, you know, uh, which was important for me uh, financially to be able to do that. Uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you told me earlier that um, when you went to UT Austin, uh, you, were, you were still sort of in a bit of a general philosophical studies uh, program. Yeah. And at a certain point, you were kind of guided to uh, bioethics. Tell us about that. Sure. This was a, a, a real uh, coincidence um, because bioethics was not on my radar in my first couple of years in graduate school. Bioethics really wasn't was just emerging as a sort of an independent field of inquiry within right. ethics at that time. Um, so one, one spring afternoon, uh, uh, one of my <laughs> classmates and a good friend of mine who was a couple of years ahead of me, who also has made a career in bioethics, his name is Larry McCullough, and some of you may may have some acquaintance with Larry's work. Anyway, he approached me and said, hey, John, how would you like a summer job? Um, and I said, well, uh, tell me more about it. I don't have a summer job. And he said, well, I've been working for the last couple of years uh, as a research assistant for a fellow named uh, Tris Engelhardt, who is uh, a, a, an MD, PhD on the faculty at the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston. And He's working in this new field of bioethics or medical ethics. Um, and he needs, since I'm finishing up my degree and going off to a teaching job, he needs a new research assistant. So I did decide to take that job, moved to Galveston, uh, worked with Tris Engelhardt, who is a very charismatic and fascinating guy, uh, uh, actually several times over the next several years. And uh, also he was a very, gracious and generous mentor. And so he helped me find a, 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 a teaching position in bioethics when I finished up my uh, PhD. And I've been in it ever since. Um, um, uh, so it was, you know, it was a great uh, um, opportunity for me and, and uh, to sort of get into this new field of bioethics um, fairly early on. Um, my first job was in 1979 and my first permanent job was at the new medical school that had just been founded several years earlier at East Carolina uh, and I joined the faculty there in, uh, in July of 79. 
I spent, as you as you mentioned, almost 30 years there before I uh, took the job. I mean, now uh, at the Wake Forest School of Medicine. So, you know, most of my career has been doing bioethics and clinical ethics at um, at academic medical centers and medical schools. So that's great. Uh, tell us what what was it about medical ethics, bioethics that that intrigued you, and what what has your you know your, your intellectual uh, curiosity been piqued by the most? Sure. Um, so uh, in graduate school in philosophy, I tended to be more interested in sort of less technical areas of philosophy, not so much philosophy of science, not so much philosophy of language, which were very dominant areas within philosophy at that time. Um, mm -hmm. um, and uh, so when I, when I had this opportunity to get an introduction to medical ethics, I thought, wow, this is really interesting stuff. It's very practical. It's, it's very applied. It really makes a difference for people's lives. Um, and there is a, a, a valuable contribution that philosophy and that scholarship can make to understanding these difficult issues and to guiding people. And that really appealed to me. So that's why I decided, I, you know, I did want to pursue that as my primary um, area of, of expertise. Um, it was just that it was, it was uh, interesting. It was, it was um, relevant. Um, it was new, <laughs> there were lots of things that made it attractive. Um, Can you tell us a quick story or an anecdote about where you found uh, bioethics to uh, really, you, you said practical, so mm -hmm. that, that, that got my attention. Mm -hmm. uh, where, where the practicalities of that really uh, fell for you and, and, and what, what was the, the, the focus? Sure. Uh, I, I, um, I think folks here uh, probably have seen that in their own work and in their own experiences. Um, uh, uh, it, it's certainly important in, in the care that we provide to folks. My primary area of interest is, is clinical ethics. That is the ethics of uh, medical uh, care. Um, and uh, within that area, I've spent m most of my uh, research focus on ethical issues in care of patients near the end of life and in uh, ethics of emergency medical care. So, you know, those are when people are approaching the end of life, when they have medical emergencies, those are really important moments in their lives. And it's so important that um, we treat them with respect that we uh, help them to make difficult decisions. Um, uh, and so those are the kinds of things that, uh, that, that I think are, are, you know, really make a difference for people. And, you know, we see this all the time here in our medical center, and this is true for all academic medical centers in the um, ethics consultation requests that we receive. Um, you know, we get requests to help our, our uh, medical teams and patients and families really um, struggle with difficult decisions and uh, and and we hopefully we, we hope we can make um, some contribution to helping them make good decisions about those very important issues in their lives so you know I think there's just lots of, 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 um, of, of practical value to the to this work absolutely so I'm I'm Looking back on your on your bio, when you mention emergency medicine, uh, mm -hmm. you're you're just finishing up, I think, or or maybe you just have finished uh, your your term as chair of the ethics committee of the American <laughs> College of Emergency Physicians. I finished the first year, but they've asked me to to chair the committee a second year, which is ah. fairly standard for that. <clears throat> okay, I'm doing it again in the in the coming year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, so what what is the most um, uh, interesting part of, of that role as chairing that that uh, committee of, of bioethics and, and emergency medicine? Sure. Well, um, this is a standing committee of the college. Many medical professional associations 
have ethics committees and um, it is charged to do a number of things. It's charged to help develop policies uh, for uh, the college on ethical issues that are important to its members. Um, it's charged to develop um, and, and write scholarly papers on issues um, of interest to uh, uh, emergency physicians regarding ethics. Um, it also play, has a role in reviewing um, uh, ethics charges brought against members of the college um, mm. for uh, 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 act actions that are viewed as um, uh, violating the ethics uh, code uh, that has been adopted by the college. So those are just a few of the, 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 the tasks of the committee. So as chair, my job is to help uh, identify the objectives for the committee every year and then to appoint members of the committee to serve on work groups to um, accomplish those objectives and then to sort of shepherd the, the work of those work groups um, so that uh, they can accomplish the objectives, send on policy proposals to the board of directors of the college, publish research papers on the topics that we've identified as important, that kind of thing. It's a, yeah, it's a fairly large committee with probably 25 members. All the rest of the members are emergency physicians. So I'm kind of the odd person in that committee. Um, but anyway, um, you know, it's been, a, I've served on that committee for, oh, more than 30 years. And it's been a really valuable experience for me. And so I'm, I'm happy to, to be a, play a leadership role for a couple of years. Great. So my clinical colleague here has a has a question. Yeah. So so <laughs> I'm going to out a little bit of my bias here, but I think that we as clinicians have blind sights in what we do when we're caring for people. We we have a you know our own our own philosophies of what people should or shouldn't do when they're seriously ill and that kind of thing. And we bring those to the table with us. What is, how can we use bioethics committees and people like you to improve the quality of care for seriously ill people? Because I don't think we know a lot of times what we're doing or how we're doing what we're doing. Yeah, uh, so uh, one way that that can happen uh, through our ethics consultation service is to offer advice upon request to medical teams and to patients and families when they're uncertain about what is the best course of action uh, in a particular situation or when uh, there is disagreement about what is the best course of action. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it turns out that the majority of the requests that we get for ethics consultation are about care near the end of life uh, because mm -hmm. that's so important and because people have different um, views about what is the best way to, uh, to, 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 to get care uh, at that time. So that's certainly one way. We also uh, have a policy function in our ethics committee so we develop policies on things like do not resuscitate orders, advanced directives, treatment decisions near the end of life, um, determination of death by neurologic criteria. Medical centers have to have policies on all of those uh, issues or pretty much all of those issues. And so we try and develop really helpful guidelines for people. Um, one of the ones we recently have revised, for example, is a policy on deactivation of cardiac implantable electronic devices for people who are approaching the end of life, which is a tricky issue. Um, um, and uh, we're hoping to offer guidance to help people uh, um, make those decisions and have those decisions honored. But we've also done some, I think, important work um, statewide uh, that I hope has improved end of life care. I was one of, I think, four or five people back about 20 years ago that uh, uh, under a grant that was given to the Carolina Center that was led by Dee Lehman at that time, uh, hmm. went up to La Crosse and got the uh, instructor training in the La Crosse Respecting Choices uh, mm -hmm. approach to facilitating 
uh, advanced care planning and advanced directives. And so that group of folks came, came back to Carolinas and did dozens and dozens of workshops to train advanced care planning facilitators. Um, and uh, Keith, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think our uh, uh, chaplain interns are still using the, the Respecting Choices curriculum to, to, to become advanced care planning facilitators here for us at, at Wake Forest. Is that right, Keith? Actually, we quit a couple years ago. Oh, we did. Due to time and money. Ah, okay. Uh, and and uh, to be uh, uh, upfront, actually, the things that we teach our chaplain residents uh, really encompass a lot of the aspects of what Respecting Choices does as well. Okay, yeah. And the other thing that I think maybe some of you know is that a group of us here in the triad about a, a decade ago said, we think we need a better form, a better uh, approach to advanced directives um, that's simpler, easier for people to use. And so a group of us got together, drafted a, a simpler form, uh, got our hospitals to approve the use of that form in our hospitals. Um, and uh, that form, I think, has been viewed as a useful form for hospitals all around the state of North Carolina and is now in wide use. And so my view, my impression is that that form makes it easier for people to understand and complete advanced directives and easier for clinicians to interpret and apply advanced directives. So those are two necessary conditions for making uh, advanced care planning a useful tool. Um, so that's another, you know, uh, I think important way that we've been able perhaps to advance the the, the, uh, the usefulness and the importance of, of advanced care planning and advanced directives here in North Carolina. Um, so I think there are lots of things that we can do and that we do do in uh, our hospitals to, to help clinicians and families and patients um, um, address these issues. Absolutely, and, and thank you for that. Um, I didn't realize that you were involved in the development of that simplified form, but that, that has been a, a major improvement in, in, and hopefully we'll continue to work in that area. And, and, and again, thank you for your participation. We're not finished yet, but participation with the uh, Serious Illness Coalition, because I think it's folks like you and, and, and many uh, you know, all of our members that uh, really make it a, a better place. Um, Mary Bethel asked a question. You kind of answered it in part, but let me let me just give you another opportunity. And I know Stan has a question as well. And Keith ha had a comment. He said, uh, is it true that only really smart people wear bow ties? And <laughs> yeah, I'm, I think that's definitely that's that, that uh, is uh, is for sure. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, he wears them uh, as al almost as much as I do, if not more. <laughs> did, did you have something to do with that, John? No, no, no. Keith came to uh, uh, He likes to tell the story that he came to his uh, an interview uh, to, for, the, for a job here at, at Wake Forest and uh, he was wearing a bow tie and he said he walked in and he saw my bow tie and he said, oh, I'm glad <laughs> this, I'm this, this goes well. <laughs> my wife said, don't wear a bow tie. No one's ever going to hire you with a bow tie. And I looked up and there was John and I thought, I've got this job. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. So Mar Mary asked the question, what are some of the most common ethical issues that healthcare providers are currently facing? And you've kind of addressed that, but if you have other thoughts, please. Well, uh, uh, yeah, there, you know, there's a, there's a, a spectrum of issues. Um, and as I mentioned, end of life care decisions are some of the most important ones. As a matter of fact, there are four chapters in that textbook that David mentioned on end of life care, one on advanced care planning, one on moral conflicts near the end of life, one on medical futility, and one on physician aid and dying. So I spent a lot of time talking about those issues. But as important, if not more important, are uh, issues like uh, making sure that people uh, provide informed consent to their treatment, which of course involves giving them the information that they need in order to be informed and consent to mm -hmm. treatment. Um, there are important uh, confidentiality issues that are always part of the, of the physician-patient uh, relationship. 
Um, there are very difficult issues at the beginning of life as well as at the end of life, as all of you folks well know, uh, um, in, in terms of, um, you know, of course, uh, termination of pregnancy and care for very severely um, ill newborns. So um, those are some of the basic issues that we cover in the sort of core survey course in ethical and social issues in medicine for our medical students here at, uh, at, at, at the medical school. Um, and there are, there are a number of others as well. I mean, the pandemic has raised lots of important issues and has really highlighted the, the, the fact of disparities in access to health care and raised questions about what should be our response to those disparities and how can we um, um, give people uh, a better access to quality health care. So that's certainly a, you know, an issue that we struggle with and, and um, haven't, haven't solved yet, <laughs> haven't, uh, have a lot more work to do there. Um, so those are just a few of the of the basic issues that um, that we that we deal with. Thank you, thank you. So I, 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 this will probably have to be our last question. But Stan had raised his hand, so let, let me ask him to to articulate what he was thinking. Thank you, and thank you, Dr. Moscow, for for what you do. Very, very important to say the least. But I was wondering, whenever you're chasing the answers to these ethical questions, uh, which of course. Uh, as you're posting, they're just numerous, numerous, and, and always changing. And you mentioned that everybody seems to have a little bit different idea about which way to go and, and their own philosophies. Yeah. Uh, do you utilize do you utilize uh, patients and family members in any patient family advisory committees to uh, to help you out with uh, uh, with with questions? Uh, and answers that they may have, and um, mm -hmm. and also uh, helping you to, uh, as you said, you're working really hard to make sure that what you uh, put as far as uh, training uh, that's easily understood and accepted by uh, people in the emergency services or wherever, mm -hmm. and uh, having having a family and patient. Uh, insight as far as uh, as far as how to post these things and how to how to word them. Uh, do you have anything like that that you've utilized uh, at at the school? Sure. I mean, th I think there's more we could do there, but what well, we do do some things. For example, we do have uh, uh, members of our clinical ethics committee who are lay people who are not uh, uh, employees or staff or faculty. Right or physicians here at the medical center. So one of those, for example, right now is a local uh, minister. Um, so represent uh, that particular point of view. Um, and it's also the case that uh, in our ethics consultation work, um, we uh, fairly often will uh, include patients less often patients because patients typically aren't able to participate, but family members in um, ethics consultation meetings that we have to discuss the issue that um, has arisen and to help see if we can find common ground and find a way forward to make a decision about the plan of care for a patient in a, in a tough situation. So we do uh, want to uh, engage family members and understand their points of view in those situations and uh, help our medical teams understand where they're coming from and what their concerns are. Um, we also offer uh, continuing education courses for folks uh, within and outside our um, medical uh, center, but those are really focused not so much on patients and families as on um, healthcare professionals who, who are interested in you know, continuing education issues in 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 bioethics. Um, so it's a, that's a it's a it's important, and we could I, I I will confess we could do a little more there than we we currently are. Um, well, maybe we'll we'll have an opportunity to to chat about that some more because we've got our new chair of the uh, uh, caregiving and patient engagement working group here, Karen Appert, and Stan's I think engaged in that so. 
Anyway, thank you very much, Dr. John Moskop. It's wonderful to get to know you a little bit better and uh, get a little bit of, of understanding of who the person is behind the bow tie. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to, to do this and appreciate folks uh, tuning in uh, and uh, listening. Uh, I'm, I'm, it's a pleasure to talk with you. All right. Well, hope everybody has a good weekend and uh, enjoy your time and, and be safe. Thanks again, John. You bet. Mm -hmm. Y'all take Bye care. Everybody.